No mai hari mai ki te art talks o Aotearoa Art Fair. Ko te walking the system, ko reiro. Ko Zara Stanhope toko ingoa, ko Otu Kai Fakahari o Gavit Brewster Art Gallery Mete Lin Lai Centre. Uh, no rere tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Welcome everyone. This is the second of the art talks at the Aotearoa Art Fair. Um, brought to you really by the Govett Brewster Art Gallery. Um, but today, really, we're focusing on um, three fantastic artists that we want to talk about working the system. Um, before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge Ngāti Fata or Oraki, whose land we're on today, and the other iwi and hapu uh, of Tamaki Makoro. I'm Zara Stanhope and I'm the facilitator for today's discussion. And it might seem a little bit or ironic to be talking about working the system inside the bowels of an art fair, but um, we all know that the art world is a very complex ecosystem comprising of public galleries, commercial galleries and spaces, artist initiatives, collectives, independent practitioners and a number of other interconnected forms as well. And so we really want to have a conversation with you um, between ourselves all together here on the questions particularly of how artists can locate equity in this art ecosystem. Amidst the precarity of living as an artist, particularly an independent artist, and how to sustain a practice. I think we're all pretty aware of the mounting frustration um, that we've been part of over the last 12 months or more, which really grows from um, the crisis of a lack of funding for artists. And I'd say it also grows from a complete absence of valuing of artists and often art forms as well in our society. As the collective DAMN said recently, artists have had so many conversations about what's broken and now we want to see actionable changes. So today's an opportunity to hear from some key individuals who have been and are experimenting with models for working differently against, within and alongside of arts infrastructures. Having developed projects guided by their own values, today we're going to ask and talk about how have you made it work and what valuable learnings are relevant now. As we've got some detailed bios on the Art Fair webpage, I'm going to do some really brief introductions and then we're going to get starting uh, into the Correro. And we're going to start with Mel, and then Dane, and then Ruth. But I'd really like to introduce each speaker first. Melanie, Tangere, Baldwin, Nate Poruru, and Nate Horawai. Melanie's known to many of you as a multidisciplinary artist, curator, arts educator, and one of the um, originators and a current director of Hoya Gallery, right next door to us. So I hope you've been in there. Melanie's committed to the advancement and recognition of the dynamic nature of contemporary Maori and indigenous art practices and the necessity of artists creating their own models. And you're going to talk about that a little as we go forward. Ruth Buchanan, also I think known to many of you, Te Atiawa and Taranaki Iwi, an artist who's been working between Europe and Aotearoa. And the recently arrived back to town director of art space Aotearoa. Ruth's work draws out contested relationships and often interrogates the cultural infrastructures that shape our lives and she actively asks if these might operate otherwise. And Dane Mitchell, living and working in Tamaki Makoro for a short while longer before going off to Nam, Melbourne to be at the VCA. I think over the last decade or so, Dane, your practice has been stimulated by and navigated the opportunities and challenges of working, working locally and nationally and internationally, often undertaking residencies as well, um, investigating those pathways and being part of exhibitions, including major biennales. But I think today we really um, would like you to talk a little bit about working with Judy Durra and Ruben Patterson as Artists for Equity and particularly the work you've been doing about resale royalties and working with the Ministry for the Arts. But we're going to start with Melanie. Um, so thank you, Melanie, for opening up the discussion today. Kia ora. Oh, kia ora 
Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Kia ora koutou. Um, ko Hekurangi te maunga, ko Aputeaua, ko Ngāti Horoai, ko Te Atanga Matinga Hapu, ko Melanie Tangaere Baldwin Ahau. Um, I am from Ngāti Purao in Rongomai Wahine, um, but I spend most of my time with my Ngāti Horoai whānau at Te Horomarae, um, where I'm currently the chair. <laughs> so, um, and, and I'm saying that because we're artists, we're practitioners, whatever, we run spaces and we look after each other, but we're also members of our community at a really significant level. Um, and there can't be a separation between those things for what it is that we're trying to achieve as um, with Hoya and my kind of personal obligations, which there isn't much um, difference between those things, is that we need to be allowed to be creative, but we also need to be allowed the time and space to actively contribute to our communities um, as, as Māori. Um, the separation isn't there. So Hoya was started um, kind of to see if we could create a space that was nurturing with Mātauranga Māori at its core, but was recognised... Oh. What I'm trying to say is that we have a very... Um, it's a priority for us to be taken seriously. So there can be an expectation of what a wahine Māori-led artist-run space should look like, that you can presume what our practice is, that you could presume a lot of things about us, especially if we're based in Te Tairawhiti, all have an education in um, Māori visual arts. It's all of our all of our degrees are in Māori visual arts. And so then already people are drawing, painting a picture of what they then expect our practice to be and the standard of that and the standard of our um, capabilities of academic kind of... What is our academic potential? Can we hold conversations? Can we stand our ground if we were in a different community that wasn't ours? And the point of Hoya is to say, yes, and we can do that incredibly well. We can fight you on that. <laughs> we can stand very firmly in our right to um, create whatever it is that we create <laughs> because we're telling our story and there's no one that can direct how that is done. As long as our obligations are to our community, to our mātauranga, to all of those things. So that's our main priority, as well as, as a model, manākitanga is our foremost priority. So our gallery is thoroughly accessible to our community. If it's not, we've failed. If our community can't see themselves within our space, we've failed. So it's like, how can we have a relevant high-level contemporary practice and make sure that Māori from Te Tairawhiti can come in and feel participatory and valued within that space. So our model is about looking after each other, looking after our community, but also being like, we don't need to dumb ourselves down in order to do that. We need to bring everyone up to the level so we can all understand it. Um, if people can't understand it, then we all work together to make sure that, you know, we, we can learn to, to understand everything together. No, one, no one's too dumb to learn, um, if that makes sense. I think it can be daunting to enter art spaces and art worlds and to kind of feel relevant because you're, you don't know the answer or you're not sure if you know what it's about. And so it's about education in term, or, and learning together. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a spiel, but that's what we're about. And we, um, we're non-commercial, so we, we want to be non-commercial forever. We never want to have that, the need to sell as a priority for us because it takes away the politics, takes away the, um, the experimentation, it takes away the freedom in a lot of ways. And, and artists are constricted in a lot of places by 
by a lot of things. And if we don't have to sell the work, then what can they make just for our space? You know, in that space, you can do whatever you want as long as, you know, your co papa is enriching or whatever it is, if it's relevant. But, um, so yeah, we're funded through Creative New Zealand. We've, we go through Arts Grants funding, um, which is really beautiful. It pays for our children, it pays for our families, it looks after us, but it's precarious. It's a very um, stressful way to exist. Um, it's stressful to have you know, a number of people on the books and to be like, you can, you can work six months from now. So we don't want to have to change. We don't want to have to start selling ourselves or, or our work um, we think that it's a necessity. Well, I think, I'm not I'm saying we anymore. Um, I think that it's imperative that the places like this exist um, without having to find money because that's not what our jobs are as artists. We're not very good at the admin sucks and I'm really bad at it. But, but I've been learning and I'm learning that it sucks and I'm not very good at it and I don't want to have to... to um, yeah, if, if we employed somebody to be our bookkeeper, we can't employ somebody to do the public programming. So we have to be able to do both. And it's just kind of understanding that it's very difficult, but it's, I believe that it's a necessity that artists have spaces to be free, to be artists and to learn together. Yeah, is that enough? <laughs> Sorry. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mel. Um, so you get some funding from Creative New Zealand, which is for a period of three years. Did you say? No, we when, we when um, so we have just been getting six month six art month. grants, and we were eligible for the one the annual arts grant this year. But the time period to apply um, was short, and we were all in a, uh, in a residency at the time and it was like either spend that residency writing an arts grant application or have a residency, like just learn. And so I just was like, I'm not going to apply and we'll just kind of put ourselves back on the cliff for another year, which was a really horrible decision to make but it was also really necessary for my mental health and for my practice. And yeah, it does feel... Yeah, it does, it's not a lot of money, but it's the money that kind of, yeah, it feeds people. And that's what I think about. I don't think about it in terms of um, career development or, or whatever. That money feeds families. There's a lot of kind of lateral goodness when it comes to what it is that arts grant funding does. And it's a really beautiful thing that we are given, but it's just really, really hard to kind of maintain the um, energy to exist within that system. We're almost always at burnout. Um, but yeah, but the fact that people's kind of lives are in your hands and you're typing, <laughs> um, you have to carry on. And so sometimes I get very stressed out that the night that I wrote the application, I was very tired or it was during lockdown and my kids were at home and <laughs> I had to do it for, you know, those, the realities of what it means to have these spaces exist. Um, it's not fun. Uh, and it feels um, valueless. Like it feels as though people really, really love the outcome. People are all very um, positive and affirming about what it is we present. But um, there's no value in the labor that we put into it, it's just very, um, besides from artists, every artist is like, oh, it's so hard, eh? we're all so poor. But it's not about poverty because it's a privilege to be fighting within this space. I mean, I'm not, I'm not at a cleaning union meeting right now and I, I know that, so it's not, it's not as though I'm struggling at a level that is real and a real struggle but it's struggling at a level that means that um, we can tell our stories and we can tell them well. And I think that's, a, that's you know, it's a, it's a part of the ecosystem of our communities that's valid, but yeah, that's it. 
And what would it look like if you did feel that you were valued and you didn't have to make compromises like this about daily life and who, who, who's able to eat? I just think that, you know, we work hard and we do well and perhaps people listen and notice after three or four times that you have done what you say you are going to do, you've done it really well, perhaps the next time you don't have to explain it from the very beginning every single time and, and describe value in a very... Um, I can't just tell you that we want to have a um, highly qualified, respected weaver go to a marae and teach the community there um, how to care for their harakiki and get basic weaving skills. That should be all I need to say because the reputations of everyone involved are there. Instead, I have to say the reach of this program is this. I can prove that the long-term effects of it, it's like, do your homework <laughs> and then just give me the money because, <laughs> yeah, I would rather that people, that we failed and we got a hiding for fail, failing than succeed every time and then be presumed to not be successful the next time. Um, it's a backwards model that's really, really, really hurtful to kind of have to keep climbing that tree. It sucks. <laughs> Kira, Kira yeah. Mel. We'll come back. We'll come Kira. back to Mel's discussion. Dane, I think we were going to turn to you next and open up for your comments, please. Um, Kia ora, Mel uh, and Zara and Ruth. Nice to be here with you all. Um, yeah, the, uh, just to, wanted to respond to something Mel said about uh, this kind of notion of a, of a backward model, um, and I, I, I think in a way that's uh, what we've that what we've been trying to do with this group, uh, Equity for Artists, which I'll explain a little bit more for those who don't know about it, um, is to yeah to try and uh, talk uh, yes yeah, sp speak further up that um, that chain of power and speak directly to ministry, kind of leaping over the heads of CNZ and trying to talk to the Ministry of Culture and Heritage about um, an, an issue that, that, that we see as something that can be um, actioned and, uh, you know, quite easily kind of legislated to support artists. Of course, um, the, so just to go back a little bit, um, I'm just describing Equity for Artists, which is a, a, a group uh, that we started during lockdown, Judy Darrow, Ruben Patterson and I. And we, um, it was at a time of, of, you know, precarity for everybody, of course. And uh, we were just having a discussion um, amongst ourselves about uh, in, the, in the later stages of, of the lockdowns where um, the secondary market was incredibly buoyant and there were these very large um, secondary market sales taking place. And um, it occurred to us that a conversation that was at ministry back in 2008 had sort of died and faded on, on the table um, around the introduction of a resale royalty uh, legislation in this country. And um, we simply sort of decided that we would, tr that we would try to you know, um, raise awareness about this, uh, about the possibility of this being um, something that we should think about in this country, try and um, discuss it with various art communities and, and speak directly to ministry about this and why we see it as um, valid. Certainly it's not going to change anyone's life, but it's, a, it, it's certainly, what, in, in our discussions with many artists, what we what we have realised is that, although it only fa it only you know there's very few people that actually, perhaps um, benefit directly from resale royalties in the secondary market, that it does um, validate practice, validates artists, and values their their IP. Um, it, it acknowledges that 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 we are tethered to our work, the work that we that we produce and create in ways um, that, that is uh, beyond uh, thinking about an artwork as a, as a chattel on the wall. Um, also, uh, for us, we were, we were sort of thinking about the, um, what we were witnessing as a participation of the secondary market in the, in the um, arts ecology of this country, um, but at a distance. Certainly, there are fantastic you know, producers of publications and conversations and content, and um, 
but but at the, um, at the expense of us in many respects. Uh, the, I think when we first uh, sort of launched Equity for Artists, our, we sort of um, launched with this kind of around an auction of, a, of an estate and, you know, it was quite telling to just sort of read the figures of, you know, 16, over $16 million worth of sales, that the, that the commission for the auction houses is in the area of two, two and a half million, and that artists receive zero dollars for their for their for their IP, and so we wanted we were really interested in trying to re, re, redress this to seek to to um, to have this looked at again, and um, yeah, so the remit's very narrow on what Equity for Artists has been trying to do. We acknowledge that it's not um, it, it's it was a it was a means to kind of uh, hit a single issue. And really uh, try and address it at uh, a ministerial level, um, and um, we're really pleased to see that the ministry have picked this back up. Not just because of what we've been doing; a whole lot of other factors are at play for that. But um, what's been really fantastic is that artists are at the table in that conversation. Artists are—it's more than a conversation; it's the writing of legislation. So we're, um, you know, we're we're part of. The dynamic that determines how that um, resale royalty will look in this country, um, and yeah, what else can I say about it? Yeah, we, we've um, right now the 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 I'm part of a uh, a group um, of there's 12 of us that are working with the ministry to kind of uh, work through the language of that legislation. And one thing that we're hopeful of with that is that there might be a way for artists and estates to opt in. Uh, as a means to create a fund whereby that money can be redistributed to artists uh, in new and meaningful ways. And I think um, what's exciting about that proposition is, is that it might be, um, yeah, it might be a means for, uh, for artists to support artists and for um, estates to support artists. Uh, and yeah, so we have some hopes about um, the shape of that and those conversations are, are ongoing. So Artists for Equity, that's the three of you, Judy, Ruben and yourself, um, did you form like a not-for-profit or anything or just give yourselves a, that um, title? We just, yeah, we, just, we just kind of gave ourselves this name Equity for Artists, which was, of course, thinking about equity and, and, its, and its, du its dual meaning. And um, rather, rather um, sad, I think, to say that when I went searching for the URL, um, equityforartists.com was available. You know, no one, no, one had, no one had nabbed that one up. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's very it's very loose in terms of its structure. What I mean, we've been sort of very kind of quick to respond to um, an uptake, uh, an interest, and um, in, in in this issue, and trying to be in front of it and communicating back to people what the kind of key facts are and what we need to what what might need to happen in terms of collective management, collective organisation around this. And so we've, it's, it's been very fast and responsive in that way. And so it's just been very grassroots in the shape that it's taken. And, but, but given that that legislation is now kind of you know, in train, with, we're now starting to think about what this entity could do um, next, in a sense. And what seems, to be its, uh, what seems to be most advantageous about it as a structure, well, it's not a structure, it's a thing. Um, uh, is that it? You know, it is speaking to ministry. We do have a kind of channel to speak directly to ministry, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussion recently about, you know, the the difficulty of CNZ of, of getting CNZ funding, of the disappointment of not receiving it, and I think it's really important that we remember that that money comes from ministry. So we need ministry to to come on board and support the arts in a more kind of fundamental and meaningful way, and I think also just I just want to extend that to suggest that. Those people in the arts with positions in public institutions, um, with power, with voice, and with agency, need to be, you know, forcefully representing us. I was, you know, really disappointed to see in an article recently in Stuff by a journalist, Andre Chumko, who's been very good at sort of diligently working through issues to do with resale royalty. Um, he, he, there was an article he wrote a couple of weeks ago about, you know, Tip Upper's uh, acquisition budget hasn't changed in 20 years and which is you know not even to meet um, inflation and that's money for artists through sales that's that's tangible makes a tangible difference to the lives of artists collected by Te Papa. and um, it was disappointing that the director was 
not forcefully saying, yes, this must change, we must fight for more, we, you know, at least infl- to meet inflation. And I think it, we, we, need to, we need to put pressure on our, on our own selves and um, those in um, seats of power within our context to, to do more and to, beyond facilitating, you know, you know, produce and create action. Particularly those institutions that should be there for artists, um, that's their purpose. I uh, just wanted to also really clearly define resale royalties. So that's in once a work gets into the market, right, might be at an auction house or could be even a, a dealer, selling a work for the second or other times, further times, a percentage of that sale price is what would be the royalty. Yep. Yep. Sorry, apologies, I should have yeah, defined right. that. Yeah. Define um, yeah, so exactly. Second, so it's a, a, a secondary sale or a third, fourth, or however many it might be that um, it acknowledges that an artist uh, retains the, not just the copyright to their work, but the intellectual property of it um, over, that, over that, um, that artwork, and that when it's resold, a percentage of that goes back to the artist. Um, and it's, it's a small, we're talking a very small amount, it's 5%, um, and there are 80 other countries who have, um, have resale royalty schemes. Um, there's great research out there that this does not affect um, the, the primary market in any tangible way. There's, have they, they, there was no, there's been no research to suggest that it, 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 it causes issues for primary market um, participation. Um, and, and also, um, yeah, it's just, uh, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so it doesn't, it's, 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 the research has suggested that, but also what it does is it creates a, a kind of false glass ceiling for uh, New Zealand artists and that we, in order to, in order for New Zealand artists to benefit from resale royalty schemes in countries that do have it, we have to have one. It has to be reciprocated, a reciprocal agreement. So there are many cases, and we've had many artists, not many, let's say we've had about five artists in the last four months report to us that you know their work has come up for sale in Australia, in auction houses, they've been contacted by the resale royalty um, collection management organisation, and they're like, sorry, you're from New Zealand, you don't get your money, and they don't get it. So, um, yeah, it, it, not having it, you know, curtails the possibilities of New Zealand artists to succeed or to, to have fruitful, you know, economic realities in other parts of the world. Why? why? Because it, it's a, it has to be a reciprocal agreement. So we must, we need to have one in order for those citizens to benefit from that same program or uh, uh, legislation here, yeah. So you, as an artist, you've taken agency with your other collaborators to take action, right? So um, in a sense, you're also asking inst- institutions and others to support you, but it's been the artists yourselves who've had to drive that change, get that opportunity to speak to the ministry, and now you're in the ministry. Mm. So what we need to do is get behind you to enable those conversations to go deeper and wider, right? Because this is an opportunity that is hasn't been available previously. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And, you know, so we're really open to people approaching us and talking about ways that we can, you know, think smarter about how this could be beneficial to more artists. I mean, that's that's at the crux of the, perhaps the largest, um, you know, problem with this model is that it is, you know, a very small number of artists that it actually has real tangible... Um, a fixer. But I would, but I would also suggest that that's that is valid in its own right. I mean, someone like uh, Robin White is a really interesting example. I think of somebody who, you know, in the seventies was selling work for fifty dollars, and you know, so to, in order to survive, and why should she not um, have the right to benefit from the investment that she's made in this long, meaningful career um, for work that appears for much greater sums of money um, uh, now, and. Yeah, I, I mean, so we're open to discussion. We, you know, love to think about how it is that we might use this platform, this thing, this thing that's got some momentum to do other things. I mean, I haven't wrapped my head around this notion of artist wage and what that looks like in other economies, but it's something that um, we're, we're thinking about, like, you know, doing some further thinking into so that we might be able to talk that back up that, um, that chain of power as well. Thanks, Joan. Oh, there's a question there. Yeah. So it's a good question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the resale uh, percentage of those markets is already in uh, legislation in eight, about 80 countries around the world. So what's stopping it just going through here? It's just, it, it, I mean, it's, tra- it's tracking. 
No, they've announced it's happening. So yeah, that's the that's the that's the that's the silver lining of, of my talk here is that it's yeah, it's happening. So by 2024 we will have that legislation in, in place. So it will be happening. So it's taking so long just because that's how long people It just yeah, you know, there's conversations about the shape of it and you know, there's yeah, it, it, and definitions. I mean, we're having some really robust and interesting conversations about how you define um, you know, like there's this language that we, that's, we've been discussing around this idea of what it applies to, you know, this notion of an original artwork. And we're trying to think about the way that, which is language that's used in other countries, um, to think about sort of disentangling that a bit and trying to connect this notion of originality, not to the thing, but that it originates from a person or an entity or, or a body or, or a collaborative com, um, group or... Well, so. Exactly. No, APRA have been APRA have been very supportive and very helpful, and as as have CLNZ uh, Copyright Licensing New Zealand, which is another CMO, another collective management organisation that um, look after writers' uh, rights, and they are set up to do it. So there are no there are no kind of barriers to it in terms of the implementation of it. It's just another line in the spreadsheet of the auction houses for sales, and that money goes to one collection agency, and then it gets you know, uh, yeah. takes time. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, perhaps it's a government, it's a pro, it's a government process. Yeah. I mean, it has been in other countries for decades and particularly the hot market of Australian indigenous art was the reason that it was activated really quickly in Australia so that artists didn't lose Yep, and the, the market. But over to you, Ruth Buchanan. So thank you for joining in the conversation. I don't think that's... Um, kia ora rangi nui. Um, ko Taranaki toko maunga, ko Te Ate Aua me Taranaki toko iwi, ko Ngāti Tawhirikura, ko Ngāti Haumia, ko Ngāti Te Whiti toko hapu, ko Ruth Buchanan ahau. Um, I'm actually going to start with a poem. Um, because I think she's going to be more erudite than I could be. <clears throat> so this is a poem from beat poet Diane De Prima, who was working in New York, started writing this um, series of poems all called Revolutionary Letters in 1968, and she stopped a couple of years ago um, at her death. And this is Revolutionary Letter number 51. As soon as we submit to a system based on casualty, linear time, we submit again to the old values, plunge again into slavery. Be strong. We have the right to make the universe we dream. No need to fear science, groveling apology for things as they are. All power to joy which will remake the world. So that's what I want to say. <laughs> um, I think she says it the best, and I guess maybe just to draw some relationships between what Dane has said and Mel also. Um, yeah, my work the last five or 10 years has primarily been working closely with institutions essentially as a contracted artist. So working back end to front end, back of house to front of house to develop sort of long-term projects with them. Um, and in that time, I came to firmly believe that infrastructural work is really crucial to both creative and political work. And also, so that sort of connects to what Dane's been saying and also that working holistically in the way that um, Mel described is the only way that we can do what De Prima calls for, create space for joy, create space for imagination. Um, so I've recently become an employee for the first time of my life and I'm now director of Art Space Aotearoa located on Karangahapi Road. Um, yeah, to have an artist at the table in all of those conversations. Um, 
and I guess fundamental to my way of working or my hope is that yeah, through this insisting on a holistic approach um, that's grounded in partnership and luckily here in Aotearoa we have an amazing document that insists that we do that, um, Te Tiriti obviously, and that's sort of what I'm hoping to do in my new capacity as a director is to work in partnership with ministry, with artists, with the community, but for me it always is about lifting up the artists, like gathering around the artwork and lifting them up. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Ruth, can I ask you, yeah. so why did you think that art space was the right place to do that work in Aotearoa? or in the world? Like one of the right places, I think. Um, for me, it's really hard for me to answer that question because it's sort of the reason I think that is a complex and textured layering of personal and professional uh, understandings of what the world is and where I might have a role to play. And for me, working in... Um, Working in institutions is about service, and um, there's this great Irish poet called John Donoghue who has described service as being simply sharing your gifts with the world, and I really like the idea that service can exist in any shape or form as long as it's you expressing what it is that you do well, and I suppose with that idea that it should be about service if I'm working in, insti in an institution, then I felt the community of artists in Auckland and in Aotearoa were the ones where I could, I was best prepared to serve them. And can I ask you, I know you've um, only had a short time to reflect while you've been in the country, but how do you th think the situation is for artists here compared to maybe where you've been, in Berlin, um, or in Europe, or elsewhere? It's a comparative question, but... Yeah, which I won't answer for that reason, because yep. I don't think it makes yeah. sense to compare radically different um, contexts through my single lens. And I've only been here five weeks, so I wouldn't even have a kind of analysis of what the situation is here. Um, but I think, in general, the struggle, but also the beauty of being an artist is similar in all places, but radically different as well. Um, I am happy to be here, though, because of what here holds and the complexities that exist in our context here. So, for me, it's compelling for that reason. Namihi. Is there any reflections that you'd like to make together before we open it up for questions or on each other? No. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone would love any like responses or questions or particularly questions rather than comments but um, this is a great opportunity to talk to Mel and Ruth and Dane so if you have any. to let's presume that the funding was readily available from government what's the solution to having a channel for distributing it that becomes equitable for people to access it and how do you have something managing that channel that uh, shares your vision for equity for all artists that's tough to <laughs> um, I guess to make it simple, I'm really looking at Creative New Zealand, mm. which has this enormous power of controlling where the money goes. But they complain they don't have enough money to distribute. Mm. But the process of accessing that money is not simple, not easy, and it, it makes artists and art communities competitive with each other mm. rather than collaborative, which is another problem with it. So, what's the solution? Yeah. I 
I don't think partnership. I'm the, yeah, I, thanks, Ruth. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the, I'm the right person to answer that. I don't think I have the skill set to really think into that. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, there has been a lot of discussion and uh, a lot of vocal kind of um, yeah, expression of frustration around the way Creative New Zealand is functioning. And I'm, uh, yeah, and I, I'm not quite sure if yeah, the, the answer is more bureaucracy, um, uh, which is, as I mentioned at the end of um, uh, my, my, um, my spiel, was that um, you know thinking about things like artist wages might be? I mean, it's not something I know enough about, but perhaps there's a way that agency is given to the individual or to the collective that's actually in uh, the source of production, um, and those sorts sorts of uh, ways of thinking about partnership uh, might be might, might be interesting models. I'm I'm not too sure. I I really couldn't um, speak to it too, so clearly, and that's through lack of um, my own lack of understanding of those kind of bureaucratic forces other than understanding them to be complex and big and really hard to pull apart. <laughs> um, yeah. Anything to say to that, either of you two? Yeah, maybe I would just say that it's a service model mm. and perhaps it's about um, flipping who, serving who, and generally in a service model there should be consultation on a regular basis with the community to which the provider is serving. So in that case, if it's the ministry actually serving creative practitioners of a very broad set, then a reasonable way of consultation should be part of what happens. That's not a repetition of the bureaucratic system that's being put under critique. And I think Melanie raised a really um, valid point that we should be allowed to feel confident. So like, if you're serving your artist's community, you make them feel confident to do what they know how to do. So, partnership. Yeah, the frustration around applying for a grant and the amount of work that that entails and the kind of sentiment of do your own homework on, uh, hopefully I understood you right, but like how that process could be better from it being such a kind of closed door where as an artist or as a you know, community artist-led group or whatever, you're um, writing a proposal in your bedroom or your studio or whatever and then that's going off to the ether and you don't really know what they're looking for. Um, if there's kind of a, a general frustration around that or um, how that could be made better? I think, I mean, there's definitely ways it could be made better. <laughs> um, the Ministry tried a different model with the latest round of um, uh, COVID response grants that's happening at the moment, which was more consultation, there's like lots of rounds before they find out you're, you can enter many times. But that's an added pressure. And it's an added pressure of, okay, now I have to get public support. I have to do all, I'm still having to do a whole lot of stuff and that's the problem. It's, um, yeah, I don't blame Creative New Zealand. I, I've had a I mean, I've lived off Creative New Zealand for two years, so there's value in what's happening. It's just that it's very inequitable. Um, if you're a real your first language, it's a hard door to open because the first page is quite um, daunting. When I was a teacher at Toi Haukura, um I tried to get my encourage my students to apply for funding because they were more than um, more than eligible to, to get it or to just practice the first time, but just the thought of writing um, an essay in English that they felt that they had to do, it, it was it stopped every single one of them at the door. So, um, you know, a range of ways for, it, for applying for funding, a range of things, ways to get it. You know, it doesn't have to be very so cut and dry. 
thinking creatively about how to serve creative people and having creative people at the table that's that's the thing it's like talking with talking to ministry it does feel like you're talking to bureaucrats about art and that's a boring for an artist probably boring for them it's you're not speaking the same language so why speak to each other why wouldn't you be speaking to someone who speaks your language and that simplifies everything instantly so i hope that answered your question does it have something to, to, to do with as well narrow criteria so that everybody's application for funding has to fit a criteria. It has to be a certain type of project, um, which then limits all the stuff that we want to do, you know, that the broader um, ideas of what is considered creative, what are these projects going to be? I think as well, it's like, what is reach? What is success? So if one person and the type of um, community that we live in, e cultural ecosystem, it's um, if two people come back every week, is that not better than 200 people came one day? And, and understanding that, it's like those people's lives are changed and the people who they live with and they go home and tell the boring story to, they have to live that we've changed our life. And, and I think that that's that thing it's quantity is a really um mad way to to quantify art um success you know or uh, whatever the words are i hope you get it but it, it shouldn't be yeah how many bums are on the seat as long as one was there the whole time for the whole year it makes more sense to me to value that really highly and so Having to explain reach in the same way that someone in Auckland explains reach to when I'm talking about to tight Avati, your one person coming every week is as much as a hundred people coming every week up here, but you you are speaking the same language as the person that's applying from here. So the whole system is very inequitable. I'm really glad that I'm not trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's. Sometimes really difficult to know what the outcome might even be of a creative project. Well, hopefully you don't. You don't like, want to forecast it. We, well, you shouldn't have to be like, this is exactly... It's like, I'm not an engineer. No one's life depends on me getting the bridge right. It should just be kind of a little bit more fluid for art. You could always just burn it down, take it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments this afternoon? Well, I really want to thank Mel, Ruth and Dane uh, for their time, for the efforts that they're making, for the service they're giving, um, for all the mahi that's going on and um, not just in their own practices but holding up other artists and let us all follow those examples and see what we can do in this area as well to support um, our art community, otherwise where else are we where are we going to be? We're certainly not going to be in an art fair if we're not supporting <laughs> artists. So thank you all so much for coming and, um, and for all your time as well. And let's thank, thank our you, artists. Thank you, Thank you.